Myers versus Lemire or Lammer. Uh, and we'll uh, hear first from Mr. Beckman. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. The issue in this case is whether the magistrate judge's decision granting summary judgment to the defendant was in error. The appellant, Jamie Myers, submits that there were multiple disputes of material fact that precluded uh, the magistrate judge from granting the summary judgment motion. I know the court is familiar with the facts. Briefly, what happened is that Mr. Myers was injured when a tractor trailer collided with a boom bucket, which he was working in and which was located over uh, Maryland Route 5 in Southern Maryland. The lower court concluded that as a matter of law, Mr. Myers was both contributorily negligent and that he assumed the risk of his injuries. We submit to your honors that the facts in this case and the law dictate otherwise. One of the most important issues in this case that had to be decided precluded summary judgment, and that was the issue of proximate cause. What was the proximate cause of this incident? Was this the proximate cause of Mr. Lamer, who drove through, based on the testimony and the facts, what amounted to eight warning side, side warning signs located a mile and a half, a mile, a half a mile, a quarter of a mile from the incident, and an arrow board telling him what to move. What do the warning signs say? The warning signs say men working. All right. Okay, men working. What, what's the direction to him? Be aware. Okay. You're a tractor trailer. Be aware. All right, be aware, but you're still moving, right? You're still moving. All right, go ahead. What's the next one? He so and move closer, uh, according to the testimony of Mr. Lamer, he observed, he's talking on his cell phone. He's talking to his wife. This is the truck driver? This is the truck driver. His wife had just had a baby. They were talking on the phone, uh, and he was heading towards the intersection. He says that, and it, the testimony is conflicting, that he was as far back as three quarters of a mile but at least as far as 200 yards when he observed the bucket in the intersection. Did he ever see any of the signs? He says he never saw the signs. And there is testimony in the record that these signs were up and these signs and this intersection was set up in a way that was consistent with the way that it should have been set up. Warning the person that there was A, work ahead, and an arrow board indicating move to the left, none of which he did. Okay, so you're establishing his negligence right now. I'm establishing his negligence, but it is relevant, Your Honor, to the issue of proximate cause. It is relevant if to the extent that you can show that it's, uh, it's uh, 100%. No, I, I don't have to show 100%. All I have to show is that he was a cause of the incident. See, Pro proximate cause. As a matter of law, if your client is contributory negligent, don't you lose? If my client is contributory negligent, I lose. Which includes 1%. Yes, that, that is correct. All right. But the question is, whose act of negligence was the proximate cause of this incident? Was it the action of the truck driver uh, who says that he saw the bucket, didn't sound his horn, didn't move to the left, but attempted to get under the bucket because he think he could make it? Was it the cause? If he moved into the left lane, he would have passed the bucket. He would have been moved into a turn lane, or he could have slowed down. What was the condition of that lane? In this the lane was open. There was in no indication. In this record? I believe so, Your Honor. I believe that the testimony. Testament... There was nobody in that lane. My understanding is that I there. I understand it. In the record, what is the evidence of what the condition of that lane was? I'll, I'll have to pick it out, Your Honor. Yeah, when you sit down, show me what it says. What it does. Okay. Go ahead. So you then have the issue of what was, was the action of Eric Hadfield, who was the groundsman, who was Mr. Meyer's co-employee, who was his boss, and who was his back when he said, listen, Mr. Meyer says, listen, I've got to, I'm up in the bucket, I've got to turn my back, and I've got to 
take this bracket out to remove the light. Do you have my back? Yes, I've got your back. He then has a right to rely on that in order to do his job. And if it means that he has to turn his back. He has a right as a matter of law to do that? He has a right to perform his job with somebody who has his back. That's the purpose of the groundsman, Your Honor, is to advise him. He has to take care of his, 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 uh, his, his safety, doesn't he? he? He has to take care of his safety, but he's got to do his job. His job is not to watch the traffic. He's got a groundsman to do that. Ninety-nine times out of 100, a vehicle is going to be able to drive right under that bucket. That's not the problem. Here we have a tractor trailer that's coming along that's admittedly 13.6 feet high off the ground. Is that illegal? It's not illegal, okay. but that's why you have the groundsman to and advise those, you of traffic. Have one of those extra things up on top of the. Car. I don't believe so, Your Honor. Yeah. I think, think it was just. Risk. He's a street worker. Under Maryland law, uh, does he assume the risk? Your Honor, I think there is good law to the effect that the same duty that is owed to a pedestrian who is in the road is not the same duty that is owed to a worker in the road. That's what I'm asking. It is not. Because what the courts have said is that they are looking at what the individual does. Is his job required to take his attention off of the roadway in order to perform his job? And that was the case in the Schutz case that we have cited, where the individual was uh, a highway worker, stopped his vehicle, used the back of his vehicle, the tail uh, to come down and to do work, and he was hit by another vehicle. The defense raised the issue of contrib and assumption of risk as a matter of law. The court submitted the issue to the jury, and the court found that uh, it was appropriate to submit it to the jury. The, on appeal, the defense raised the issue as a matter of law, it should have been contrib or assumption, and the Court of Appeals says no. And what they said in that case was, what case is that now? This is Schutz versus Breback, Your Honor, that the worker in a highway cannot be as alert as pedestrians or other travelers and affirm the judgment of a lower court. And this is where he had his back to the traffic and he was struck by a motorist uh, despite the presence of men working signs, which the defendant said he never saw. So you know, it's a, it's a the logical extent of your argument is that the bucket could have been 10 feet high in the intersection. No negligence on his part. He could, it could be, Your Honor. And what would happen there is if the warning comes to him from his groundsman, look, we've got a tractor trailer coming, boom, pushes a button, and he booms up. And he booms up to a height where even the 13.6-foot tractor trailer is, is going to be able to get under it. That's why, with regard to the issue of proximate cause, the court took away that issue from the jury, where there were facts and inferences which could be gleaned from the facts that this was the cause, direct cause, of the action of Mr. Hatfield and or Mr. Lamer. There's another issue of material fact that I think was extremely important that was in dispute was, was this lane set up, set up appropriately? And the lane set up, as your honors know, had the shoulder closed and the bucket extended over the lane of traffic. And there was testimony in the record that this was an appropriate setup if you have a groundsman to warn you that there is a vehicle that can come by that can interfere with the work that you're doing. Let's go back to assumption of risk. The Claiborne cases say that as a matter of law, uh, if he was following usual procedures, uh, uh, he's not negligent. And that is correct, Your Honor. And the Claiborne case... The doctrine doesn't, of assumption risk does not apply in this kind of case under Maryland law. Isn't that correct? I submit that it was clearly in error for the court to take away this issue from the... It was at least a jury question, Your Honor, but clearly not as a matter of law. I think that you have to weigh the facts with all due respect. And we had initially filed a cross motion for summary judgment. Well, I thought that Claiborne case said it, was, it didn't apply. Yeah, and well, there there was a policeman, okay? And the policeman and was... And I thought it, also it was a subjective test anyway. It is a subjective well, test. Well, the judge, judge here said it was objective. 
She did. Said a reasonable person wouldn't have done what he did. And it is subjective. What was in Mr. Uh, Meyer's mind? What did he know? What did he see? What did he appreciate? And that was not even looked into at all, Your Honor. And that is the law of Maryland. It is a subjective uh, approach. And what the court did in Claiborne is the same thing, Judge Floyd, that the court did in the Schutz case, which is it denied a motion for summary judgment or denied a motion uh, for judgment on the basis of contrib and assumption of risk as a matter of law and submitted the matter to the jury. And what the court said there, and I think it's important, is you cannot carry out your duty as fully as expected uh, and as required and at the same time remain alert to moving traffic as our pedestrians or other travelers on the roadway. So it's an implicit recognition that the people who work in the roadway, like Mr. Myers, are in a different situation than a normal pedestrian. There is also disputes uh, as to a material fact here in the context of this. The magistrate judge found that there were genuine disputes of material fact as to Mr. Lamer's conduct. Was Mr. Lamer speeding? Was he on his cell phone? Uh, did he sound or I not sound? I thought he says he was on his cell phone. He says he was on his cell phone, but the court, the lower court said in evaluating his conduct uh, that there are genuine material disputes as to the extent to which that may have caused or contributed to the incident. If those were genuine disputes as a material fact, then how not can the conduct of Mr. Myers, who has a groundsman with his back, identify specifically what is happening if he says, let me, have you got my back? I've got to take this bracket off. And he says, yes, I've we got your back. The facts in light most favorable to your client. Yes, you do, Your Honor. And that's why summary judgment here was totally inappropriate. But, uh, what about the experts? What did the judge do about the experts? Well, the experts' reports are not even mentioned in the judge's opinion. But you had an expert that said you were doing things right. That is correct. And she did not consider it. But, but the expert wasn't excluded. It was not excluded. There's no mention in the report. There's no mention in her opinion of uh, Mr. Balgowan, who was our expert, or Mr. Miller, if who was... A, if you have a, an expert here, if your expert had been able to give his opinions, would that have created, made a prima facie case? Absolutely, Your Honor. I think it clearly would have shown. But there are other facts in the record here before you, even if you don't consider the expert report, which show that this was set up appropriately. This uh, works so. an expert that said that yours was wrong. Yes, but Disagreed. interestingly... But, but if both of them are admissible, we have to accept yours at this stage. That's correct. But the other thing, Your Honor, that is interesting is that their expert, Mr. Miller, in his testimony was asked in his deposition, this is part of the record, do you feel that Mr. Lamer was correct in attempting to get under the bucket? And his expert said, no, he was not correct in attempting to get under the so bucket. He's saying Lamer was negligent. He said he was not correct. That at least. No, but, but that would, in the light most favorable to you. It is enough, Your it's, Honor. It's, he's saying he's negligent. He, it is I'm trying to help you. It is. I, you could draw <laughs> that inference. You, to you could draw the proposition that you're entitled to the facts. That this I, I am. And if it's not correct, one could certainly argue it is negligent. And if that is the case, it raises an issue. Well, if, he, if, he's, if, if that expert says that, he's opining that the, guy was, that the truck driver was negligent. Your Honor, I can't disagree with you. All right. Okay. And clearly, those kind of material disputes uh, raised such Well, that's issues. not a dispute. That's a fact it isn't, for, that, it, that you get at this proceeding. I, I do, Your You're Honor. You're entitled to that fact. We are supposed to be accorded great deference because we oppose this. The facts in your favor, and all inferences that can, is. and all inferences that can be drawn from it, Your Honor. And if the facts are susceptible of more than one inference, which they were in this case, separate and apart from the admission, Your Honor, we get it. We get it, and it had to be submitted to the trier of fact. Thank you, Your Honors. Now, let's see.
You, Mr. Goodman. Be pleased to hear from you, sir. May it please the court. Uh, my name is Brian Goodman. I represent the appellees in this case, Mr. Lamer and Carroll County Foods. And let me just say at the outset that I've been a practicing lawyer in Maryland for a little over 30 years now. This is my first time at the Fourth Circuit, and it's a great honor. Well, we're really pleased is. to have you here, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, let me get some, a few things straight about the facts that uh, Mr. Beckman was a little bit not clear on. The, the record extract reflects that at the time that this incident occurred, uh, the, the cones were marked over on the shoulder. That's where, and that's where the two trucks were aligned. There was an open lane of travel which they could have closed off and they did not. And in terms of the left turn lane, the undisputed testimony of Mr. Lamer is that there was a car turning. He could not move over to the lane um, to, to avoid hitting Mr. Um, Mr. Myers. Additionally, uh, what's important did is... Did he the, apply his brakes? He did apply his brakes. Did he um, try to stop? He did try to stop. Uh, we can assume, for purposes of today's argument, that, I'm not going to admit it, but we can assume that Mr. Mr. Meyer, excuse me, Mr. Lamer was negligent. That's, that, that's really kind of irrelevant for the analysis that is being done here and that the issues are on appeal. Additionally, with regard to the cell phone call. Why, that, why is that rel not relevant to the proximate cause issue? Well, because the pro you don't get to proximate cause because if Mr. Uh, Myers was uh, either assumed the risk of injury or was contributorily negligent under these facts. What about the last clear chance doctrine? Well, the last clear chance doctrine. Is, is there such a thing in Maryland? There is such a thing in Maryland, and it's been uh, raised for the first time. you all time. still have that contributory negligence? We do. Absolute contributory. Mm -hmm. In terms of the last clear chance, that's been raised for the first time at this appeal. It wasn't even brought up in court at all. And I, I submit that that argument's been waived. But even if the court disagrees with me on that, the issue with regard to, um, with regard to the assumption of risk and contrib, I think that there's been a kind of a misciting or a misreading of the line of cases on assumption of risk in these roadway workers. The Claiborne case. He says that, La he says that, that when Lamer and Carroll County Foods were negligent. Lamer was their truck driver, right? No, no, no. Claiborne is the case from 1971 and 72. No, no, Claiborne, but 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 I'm talking. I'm not, but you're, in this case, they said he was he was negligent. Who's, that, who said you're, who's? You're, 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 that? That Lamer was negligent in a way he drove through there. I, I said we can assume that for this argument. That's right. Well, right. And that, why doesn't that raise the last clear chance doctrine if you want to characterize it that way? He's argued in the context of proximate cause. Well, I understand. I characterize it. I, it looked to me like last clear but chance. But he's arguing it for the first time uh, at this, at this we level. We used to have contributory negligence in West Virginia, and they did away with it. Yeah. I think only four well, states still have it. I think it's Virginia. Stuff. I'm not sure. Pardon? Yeah, Virginia. Yeah, Virginia. Um, Alabama and North Carolina, in addition to Maryland. Not they very just, many have it left. No, and they just tried to change it again this past year in that Campbell versus Soccer Association case, and the Court of Appeals once again in Maryland uh, right. said that it's, it's the law. But let <laughs> me get to the, yeah, the, yes. the, the, the notion of uh, highway workers being entitled to some sort of special status or being entitled to rely on you their... You think Claiborne doesn't apply? I do. I agree. That is, that is correct. No, you think that. I, I believe that. Well, That's what, correct. But, but, but uh, that part of the Claiborne, first Claiborne case was not disturbed. Well, but, that, but the Court of Appeals, uh, in, in its, which is, of course, uh, one step above, it's our Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals specifically said, with regard to police officers or other highway workers, they, they said, quote, they, like all other persons, must act reasonably under all of the circumstances, and the fact that they are police officers acting pursuant to their duties is one of those circumstances. So, in other words, Claiborne essentially said there's really no special status. It's just a circumstance you have to consider. And then if you look at the later cases, the much more modern cases, the ADM case, the CN construction case, and the Cotillo case, the weightlifter case. But in that language you just referred us to, that, that was pertaining to contributory negligence and not assumption of risk. No, no, Your Honor. That specifically dealt with assumption of risk. If you look at Claiborne, it specifically is talking about the issue of special status with regard to assumption of the risk. They're very, those two doctrines are very much intertwined. Uh, they really are, and, and the cases go to great pains to talk about that. But that's really what that case was talking about. Additionally, with, I want to get back to something that uh, Judge King asked Mr. Beckman about. With regard to this whole subjective versus objective test, and um, Judge uh, Gallagher in this case said it's an objective test, if you look at the Poole case, which is a 2010 or 11 Court of Appeals case, that talked about affirming Cotillo, or not affirming it, but citing Cotillo, 
that talked about the fact that really in, in these cases we go with a subjective test. But the case also says that with a subjective standard, they're not going to, it doesn't mean that any plaintiff can say, well, gee, I didn't understand this risk. I didn't understand what I was doing. You have to look at the facts of each case. Just like in the CN construction case, or more specifically the Cruz versus Hollenbeck case, where the guy was a, a, a worker on a gas line and he got injured, and that what the Cruz case said, and I believe that was 2010 or 2008 from the uh, Court of Appeals, the Cruz case said that's so uh, tied in with what you do, and you'd been, a, you'd been working on the gas lines uh, in this kind of line of work for 10 years. Well, that was also instructive to Judge Gallagher in this case. Mr. Myers had been a highway worker for eight years. He testified at his own deposition on page 88, which is part of this record extract, when he was asked, do you have to look out for, tra tra for traffic? He said, yes. He said, well, because you don't want to get in a situation where you can get hit by a tractor trailer. You have to be aware of your surroundings. Now, all the cases that talk about these highway workers are cases that deal with exigent circumstances, emergency situations. Cars, um, a, a radiator goes up, the, the hood's up, the police officer can't see. That was one of those older cases. The name escapes me right now. Um, in, in our case, um, it, it is not a defense when they had ample time to lay out this area. He could have closed off that lane of travel, and he can't, specifically in light of even admitting he it. He didn't as do all, any of that, did he? He, he didn't. was the worker. Somebody Correct. else did that. Well, but you can't rely on a third person. The cases are very clear on that. It, to say, well, I didn't assume the risk because I was relying the on the boss man did that. Right, the boss man did that. Well, that that's just not, that's not a valid well, defense. They told him to get up there and go to work. Right. And the other thing is, in terms of the way this, this situation, I mean, the scene was set up, it would have taken him maybe, this was not a hugely busy intersection like in the city of Baltimore where you've got traffic. This was down in southern Maryland in St. Mary's County. How come your guy didn't see those signs? Well, because they were over on the shoulder. They weren't in the lane of travel. Which see any of them. Of course, well, he, he might have seen some signs over there. He was talking on his cell phone to his wife. Well, again, if you're saying that my guy was distracted and arguably that's, uh, that's his own negligence, again, for purposes of this appeal, we can assume that maybe he was negligent. But it doesn't matter under the Maryland it law. It does we matter under the last clear chance doctrine. Well, um, <laughs> again, but there's no testimony. In terms of last clear chance, they're trying to twist last clear chance. The, the uncontroverted testimony was that he was off his cell phone. He saw everything in front of him. He saw the guy hanging up there and went right on, but he thought he was going to go right under him. Right. But let's not forget what Mr. Myers did. Mr. Myers is in that if bucket. If he had been talking to his wife, he probably wouldn't have been going so fast when he first got, saw that, him. That phone call was, was done. The testimony was that that phone call was done. But Mr. Myers is, is in that bucket. Is it against law in uh, Maryland to talk on a cell phone while you're driving? It is now, but it wasn't at the time of this accident. So I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to bring that up, so I'm glad you reminded me to do that, Your Honor. Um, but in terms of uh, where Mr. Myers is, now, he's in the bucket. He's got control of a button which moves him up or puts him down. He voluntarily turned his back to traffic. Whether he told his co-worker or not he was going to do that, he voluntarily turned his back to traffic when he has he's to know. He's trying to do a job up there in service to all of us. Yes. To make the highway safe. That is correct. Fix the traffic lights. Right. And whether Maryland... You say it doesn't even give him a special status. Well, it, it certainly sounds like it ought to. Uh, any highway worker out there hanging over traffic should have a special status, and I think you'd agree with that, and everybody that asked the question would agree with that. Well, I think as... Now, you as, say Claiborne doesn't stand for that. But, Claiborne says it's just... Uh, I thought Claiborne 1 did stand for that. And Claiborne 1 does. And it's still good, and Cla it's still good law. Well... That it does stand for that. Claiborne 2, though... Uh, or, and it makes all the sense in the world. Yes, I understand. Um, Your Honor, with regard to um, getting back to where I was, so he, he's got total control over what he can do vis-a-vis -vis oncoming traffic. Now, he could have, now, let's, let's ground this case back into reality. They could have easily, properly marked. He's got to be up there focused on what his job yes, is. Yes, but he could have closed that lane off. And he has to be able to depend on the fellow that's down below and on the people that laid out the project, and on, in particular, drivers of tractor trailers coming down through there uh, th that are going to use the highway, that right. they're going to do things right. But it's, it's clear under Maryland law that you can't, in terms of your own conduct, you can't say, 
I, it, this is the Campbell versus, I believe it's the Campbell versus BG&E case. That I, my boss said it was okay, so I went ahead and, and did this. I was relying on what they represented. You can't say that to avoid, the, to avoid these issues of uh, contributory negligence or, more importantly, assumption of the risk. And also, let's get back to he's trying to make us all safe. That's absolutely right. It would have been very easy for them on this particular roadway in southern Maryland to have marked off that lane of travel and just rerouted everybody over to the left lane if they would have properly marked the area. He chose not to do that. That's fine. You're saying they, and then you say he chose not to I do meant that. he. You, 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 you said they, so you're talking about the highway department. Well, of, of course. That's right. And he could have... He, and he's the underling. He's the guy that's getting up there and doing the job. Well, right. But he also but, had... But a, the engineers wanted laid out the project, right? Um, I would assume so, yeah. What happened to the expert witnesses in this case? What happened well, to them? Here's, here's what happened to them. Those um, expert witnesses, when we filed our summary judgment motion, and they filed their cross-summary judgment motion, they then, in the response, referenced the um, uh, testimony of their expert witness, which was not properly authenticated, was not properly... What do you mean wasn't properly authenticated? Well, it, it You don't have to file an expert report under oath. But they did file an expert report. And under, you don't have to file one under oath, do you? No, you don't have to file it under oath. Well, you said it wasn't properly authenticated. Because, because you, got to, you file an expert report that lays out what the expert is supposed to say. We had deposed. And, and Rule 26 gives you some guidelines on what, what to put in there. Correct. We you had make the expert report. And for the purposes of, of the uh, summary judgment, the judge has got, or the motions, the judge has got to, got to figure it all out and decide whether it's admissible or not. That's she can have a hearing. That. She, so the judge could have a hearing and decide it didn't, doesn't pass Daubert or something, but, but if it's admissible, you've got to take it into account. Correct. Before I, you grant summary judgment. I agree with that. Because otherwise you can't know what the facts are. Unless, under the facts of the case, such as this one, what the expert had to say, and there were two experts in this case, really didn't well, matter. One for you and one for them. Exactly. Right. Now, in terms of when I said properly authenticated, I probably misspoke there. We had deposed their expert. And, so you, you know, had an expert report and a deposition under oath. Correct. Well, that's pretty well... That's pretty thorough, in, and, and none of it was considered. Correct. In, right. the de in the deposition, he did not testify, and the record's clear on this, as to any of his opinions with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, or engineering certainty, I should say. That was one of our bases. But you were arguing that these expert opinions didn't come in. Correct. But the judge didn't rule on that. Well, I assume. If I have to overrule them, then they could have appealed that. But you, uh, you didn't. Uh, that didn't come. That, she didn't rule on it, so, so uh, it didn't. It wasn't. Well, when we objected to the the admission or consideration of this expert report and testimony, uh, when we replied in that regard, there was no response filed by the appellant in this case with regard to using it. So I would argue that they abandoned that because they didn't even try. They abandoned their expert report. Well, abandoned trying to use it for purposes of fighting the summary judgment. It was motion. in the record. I thought in connection with summary judgment. It um, wasn't, but it wasn't discussed. It wa right. It was not discussed by Judge Gallagher. And your, neither was yours discussed. Right. You both we did, had experts. Right. We were arguing under the facts of this case. We were really arguing the law. Quite frankly, if there were a Daubert hearing in this case. And, but the know, expert said that, what, that, the, that this project was laid out properly, that what they were doing was a fine way to do it. Uh, and and, if, and it, 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 if, if, if it comes in, it basically makes a prima facie case <coughs> for the plaintiff. Well, if, if you think... If it comes in. If it comes in. And, I'm, and I, it wasn't overruled. It wasn't no, knocked out. But the expert, if you read his, uh, uh, his testimony, his opinions were all grounded in legal opinions. They were essentially, yeah, they were negligent. You know, and that's but not... You're arguing about an expert report that was never ruled on. I got you into it. But because of the fact it was not considered. Well, I would contend. Uh, but the judge, it seems to me, before you can grant summary judgment, she's got to deal with whether it comes in or not. I don't think she because does. That's part of the plaintiff's case. Well, either it comes in or it doesn't. And if it comes in, it's a different case. If it doesn't come in, it's another case. I don't think she does so have. So nobody knows what you're dealing with here. I think we do, and I don't think she does have to deal with it because I think that under the facts of this case and the Maryland law, when you look at the law, when you look at Cotillo and you look at the ADM case and the CN case, the assumption of risk here as a matter of law and, frankly, the contrib are, are exceedingly clear. No expert on either side would affect that under the facts of this case. You can't get around the fact that the plaintiff in this case voluntarily put himself in a lane of travel without marking it out specifically said you have to watch out for a tractor trailer, 
turned his back, turned his back on traffic, got hit, and then says, oh, but gee, I didn't understand the risks, so let me get to a jury. And that just, it strains credibility. Um, it just, so I don't think that the judge really did have to deal with the expert's report. And I You're think- You're twisting it around the favor, the facts to favor you. He was, he was where he was at the instructions of his employer, Your Honor, carrying out his public duties, trying to repair the traffic lights. Right. But the uh, way he did it. So the, so the traffic lights would work right. Your Honor, I'm not twisting it. And your guy came through there talking on his cell phone, didn't notice the signs, and knocked him out of the bucket, damn near killed him. Right. Well, uh, I think the injuries uh, are really irrelevant to this argument, but in terms of damn near killed him, I mean, they're not nearly as serious as has been alleged, but that's not an issue for this court today. But what I was trying to say is with regard to, um, uh, with regard to the, the initial question you asked me a moment ago, there were so many other safe and reasonable ways that this plaintiff could have set up this scene. You're talking about an event, an issue that, could, that took him maybe two to five minutes to do. He could have set up that zone in a, in a way that was safe. And by his own testimony, you've got to be aware, you've got to look out for traffic. And for him now to come into court and say, well, you've got to be aware and be, be aware of traffic. But since I didn't, I can, I can sue because I was injured. It doesn't comport with what the cases in Maryland say, special status or not. I'm not going to concede that he has any kind of special status, but even if he does, what he did um, shows his affirmative actions on his, by his own conduct that put him in harm's way, and Maryland does not, the law does not allow uh, you to, to, to recover or file a suit. If we remove it from assumption of risk, and let's look at the contributory negligence argument, and as Judge Gregory uh, said in, in Appellant's argument, 1%, 1% is enough. Now, of course, the appellant is saying, well, but it's really a jury question because I get the benefit of all the facts. And the plaintiff at this stage of the proceeding does get the benefit of all the facts. What we know is that this plaintiff had total control of how that intersection was set up. What we know is he was on the boom. What we also know is he had the control and turned his back to oncoming vehicles. And as a matter of law, if you look at the Campbell versus BG&E case and, and of course, the, um, the Coleman uh, versus the Soccer Association case, contrib is still the law in Maryland. So whether or not you believe there's a special status or, or assumption of risk as a matter of law, clearly this plaintiff was, was somewhat responsible for putting himself there, for turning his back to traffic, and for not moving uh, that bucket to avoid a traffic. If you go to trial, you could argue that he was contributory negligence and probably get an instruction on it, too, couldn't yes. you? Yes. And, and, and get an instruction that it's a, if he found him 1% negligence, it's a complete bar. Correct. And the jury could figure it out. Yeah, perhaps. And, but, but, but under the facts of this case, there are some situations. The whether the judge is entitled to do it. Correct. Under these circumstances, we, giving him the advantage of all the facts. I'm giving him the advantage of everything including I. Including his, his uh, expert who's not been excluded. No, the expert has not been excluded. But again, given these facts, given what, um, what we know occurred. But the expert the, can't testify that what he did was proper. That's, for the, that's why she didn't lie. Exactly. But it's not been excluded. No, it's not none been excluded. Of, none of, none of, nothing that the expert proposed to testify to has been excluded. But Judge Gregory makes a very good point. Perhaps the magistrate judge said, well, the expert says that everything he did was okay, but the expert can't open. She had all the records. She had, just because she was quiet about it and didn't mention it one way or the other in her opinion doesn't mean she didn't consider it. So she probably considered it, and as I'm standing here advocating, she probably thought it's really irrelevant. Think she just overlooked it? I don't think she overlooked you think, it. You think she thought it was irrelevant? I do. You think, but you're speculating. We don't know. I can, I, it seems to me like taking the view most favorable to the plaintiff, it's coming in. But it came in. It's coming in. It, it wasn't excluded. Right. And it should have been considered in connection with the summary judgment. And we need to consider it in connection with the summary judgment, I, reviewing it de novo. I would, I, I agree with you, Your Honor. And I think when you do consider okay. it, as well, Judge good. Gregory just said, the opinions that are reflective in that expert's testimony and in his report are, are really, they don't change the fact that as a matter of law, Mr. Myers assumed the risk of his injuries and was contributorily negligent. I mean, they really don't. I've got 10 seconds left, so I do want to thank the court 
for your time and attention to this case. Are there any other questions of me? Good to have you here. Thank you, Your Honor. You did a good job for your client. Thank you, sir. Ms. Malarkey? Yes, Your Honor. Just to go back and answer the question that was raised during Mr. Beckman's argument with respect to what was in the turn lane, there's just not any evidence of that. We have... Well, then that's exactly what I said. That's what I thought. It's right. not. Because no one was paying attention. We've got no, Mr. Counselor, I don't want, it's not a jury argument here. What, what, the point is, how can you say that he's negligent because he didn't go into the other lane and there's no evidence that that was available for him? That's the point. Because he had other choices, Your Honor. What's the other choice he had? He had many choices. Like what? Like he could have not been speeding down the roadway. Okay, what's, could, what was it? On this record, what was his speed? There, there is, you're, there is this no record. What was his speed? There's no evidence Ex as to exactly. his speed. Exactly. There's no evidence of speed. He, now, what else could he have done? He testified when he got close to the intersection. He did estimate a speed of 30 miles an hour that he decreased to 15 miles an hour. Okay. What's he the speed limit? He couldn't say when. Then? What's the speed limit? I believe that it's 55. Well, then he wasn't speeding. Well, at the time that he got right under the intersection, he testified it, about that. But, so, but the only evidence as to his speed, it was under the speed limit. Correct? I think. There, there is enough evidence. No, it's not enough evidence. Answer my question. The there, only evidence of his speed is the speed that is under the posted speed limit, correct? That is correct. Is there any evidence of his going a speed that exceeded the posted? There is not. Okay, well, that's what I mean by there's no evidence of speeding. However, there, are, there is a mountain of circumstantial evidence from which a reasonable jury can conclude that he was driving negligently. Absolutely. That's what okay. counsel is conceding, that may be so. But the point is this. It is undisputed, one, that there was no evidence of excessive speed. Two, there's no evidence that truck exceeded the height limitation, correct? Correct. Undisputed, correct? Correct. It is undisputed that this accident happened because your client's bucket was lower than the permissive height of a truck that had the right to go through the intersection. Is that correct? That is not correct. All right, tell me what part is wrong. It, it is... It Answer is, my question now, counsel. This is, this is a very exact question. Your Honor, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Your Honor just wrong. stated, is it undisputed that the cause of the accident was the fact that the bucket was not high enough to avoid the trailer? Okay. You just flip it around. Is it undisputed that Mr. Lamer had the chance to avoid the collision instead? If a jury could conclude... You, you have not set a case up for, for last clear chance. Last clear chance normally applies that, look, first of all, do you concede negligence? On the part of our client? Yeah. Absolutely not. But, but then, uh, you, this is not a last clear chance uh, case then. A last clear chance case is, yes, I was negligent. However, there was enough time to observe my negligence and avoid this accident. This, you have not made that case below. Our argument Clearly. was as, as a second resort, if, if a jury were to conclude that Mr. Myers were negligent, then our position is that Mr. Lamer had the last clear chance. Our primary position... You didn't argue that below, and you don't have a case that set up the structure for that. I, I think we do. First of all, I think that last clear chance is essentially a causation argument. We made that argument below. We actually argued that the cause of the accident and that we are entitled to summary judgment and, and cross So you for said there were no facts in dispute because you asked for summary judgment. We said there were no facts in dispute as to Mr. Lamer's negligence and as to him being the ultimate sole cause of this accident. That was our argument below. But your bucket was too low. You obscured the roadway. We, you, I mean, I'm sorry, you obstructed the roadway. We obstructed the roadway for a tractor trailer driver who wasn't paying attention, who was on his cell phone, who didn't even see the signs that were coming up the roadway but, but, that were but, there but, but, in plain but view. Counsel, but counsel, even if that's true, you're still the person who obstructed the roadway. That makes you, you have to be somewhat negligent. But when you look at assumption of the risk and contributory negligence, you have to look at what was Mr. Myers thinking and what was his state of mind at the time. He did not know that his bucket was too low. He that's had his fault. No, it, he, that's why he has a guy on the ground. But the guy on the ground said from where he was, he couldn't determine that it was, he thought it was clear too. No, it, that, he, did, did, the guy on the ground got in his truck and failed to pay attention. He said, the guy what on the ground. What about negligence for your client? 
The guy on the, well, actually, Your Honor, they, they were reprimanded. It's, okay. it's, it's interesting. The only person who faults Mr. Myers is the magistrate judge. When a investigation was concluded after this accident by both the employer of Mr. Lamer and the employer of Mr. Hatfield and Myers, Mr. Hatfield was disciplined for abandoning his job and not being a proper lookout for his coworker, and Mr. Lamer was disciplined by his employer for causing the accident and colliding with a bucket that was plainly in front of him. Mr. Myers is the only person who wasn't found at fault by people who did investigations that were actually involved in this case. And my, my time is ending, but I'd just like to point out the, the doctrines of assumption of the risk is to provide a mechanism for which we can say, your conduct was so unreasonable, we absolve the defendant of any culpability, you have waived any argument that you have to say that he's responsible. This is not the case to apply that. At what distance uh, on this record should he have been able to determine that the bucket was too low? Uh, the truck driver? Yeah. At what distance? Yeah. As soon as he saw it. Or if he didn't see it, that's his fault for not seeing it. There were signs starting a mile and a half down the road to warn okay. him. Was there any signs say there were workers overhead, working done overhead? It, just a, it was generic signage, work ahead. So, I mean, that could have been somebody mowing grass on the side row. Which is exactly why you have to pay attention to what is going on. So... Because so, you don't know. So you, there are signs to alert you, and you have a heightened awareness of what is going on. Instead of being on your cell phone and not looking at someone who is plainly ahead of you, that you testified, you, or that, that you admitted at the scene of the accident afterwards to two different people, I saw him, I thought I could get under him. In the Stinchcomb case that we cited in our brief, which is admittedly an unreported decision, but of this circuit, this circuit held that under circumstances very, very similar, allowing the case to, or keeping the case from the jury would be tantamount to letting drivers on the roadway drive with impunity. That's exactly the result in this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Malarkey. Uh, we appreciate it. We'll come down and uh, greet counsel and uh, adjourn court till 9.30 tomorrow morning.